It's like we're live. Bro, I got no idea if this actually works. I got to be honest, it says live. So let's see. All right, let's see. You know what? I should probably open up social media to like actually see if it works. Because I've done this a couple of times, but I got to be honest, all this like software is is tough to figure out. Where are we supposed to be live? Uh, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope. Um, yeah, we're live. Okay, perfect. There we are. Okay. All right. So... Here we go, guys. All right. If you guys want to chat in some questions, just go right ahead. So we're we're on Facebook Live right now. We're on Twitter Live. We're on Periscope. We're on YouTube. And so, guys, just ask away your questions. All right. Perfect. All right. We got <laughs> hi, Tro. Hi, Karen. All right. Hi, Karen. I'm here with uh, Dr. Paul Saladino. We'll, we'll let some people trickle in, and then we'll get started. So, uh, oh, wow, we got Diane Ripple from, from, uh, from uh, Facebook saying hi. Hi, Diane. We got a lot of people here saying hello. Twitter. <laughs> yeah, everybody from Twitter is here. Guys, we have Dr. Paul Saladino. So we, we're going to let some people trickle in, and then you can ask us anything, okay? So I'm going to put it in here. Ask us questions and keep us busy and keep us busy because you have two physicians here. So keep us busy. We won't right. be able to talk. We don't need, I mean, I can, I can talk forever, but yeah, I know. I'd love some new questions. Okay. All right, guys. So we're going to get started. So Dr. Paul Saladino, I have your book here. I read the first edition. Very happy to have your second edition here. Right. Carnivore Code. Guys, I'm uh, very excited about this one. Look, I, I got to be honest. Uh, you take every one of my thoughts and you're like the, the little devil on my shoulder. And then <laughs> I, my board certification is like the little angel on my shoulder. So, so you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about some stuff. We started chatting before uh, we went live. And I think this kind of the discussions are relevant. We talked about diverticulitis. We talked about LDL. We talked about CACs. So where do you want to start? I'm going to let you, I know you feel passionate about, passionately about all of this. I know you're passionate about gut health, about mental health. So uh, let's let's get started. Where do you want to start? We're talk guys, we're talking about the carnivore code. The second edition is out. And this is Paul, Dr. Paul Saladino's uh, book for the forward by Marxison. Excellent book sitting right on my coffee table. So if you're one of my patients, when you come in, you'll you'll get a chance to read it and then buy it. All right. So uh, let's tell you, what do you want to talk about? How are you doing? First of all, I'm doing great. So before the, before we jumped on, we were talking about something that I think is a great starting point, jumping off point. So I just started a company called Heart and Soil. We do desiccated organ supplements. And as part of that company, I answer emails from people with questions. And a lot of the questions I get, it's an incredible tro. how many questions I get from people who are saying things like, I am in the hospital with diverticulitis and my physician says red meat causes this. I got one today. I have prostatic hypertrophy. I have a PSA of 10. And my physician says red meat causes this. And it just makes me think that the work that you are doing and the work that I am doing is very important because this is misinformation at the highest level. There is absolutely no data that this completely evolutionarily consistent food of red meat and organs, I would argue that two of the most healthy foods on the planet, two of the most evolutionarily consistent foods we've ever eaten as humans are harming humans in any way, shape or form. But mainstream medicine in every hospital, in every clinic across the country, Right now, today, on Monday, yesterday, on Thursday, there are physicians telling patients to stop eating red meat based on epidemiology or observational evidence with no actual interventional evidence to, 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 to really support this, to corroborate this. And the problem is that when people eat less meat and organs, and we've realized this over the last 70 years, they eat more carbohydrates and more processed oils and more processed sugars. That's exactly what happens. And so what does red meat and saturated fat get replaced with? It gets replaced with less nutrient dense foods that we're pretty darn sure are behind the current chronic disease epidemic that we're in the middle of. So it's just to me, this is a tragedy. And I am really passionate about a couple of things. The point of the carnivore code is not to convince everyone to stop eating all plants. It's to do two main things. It's to really exonerate red meat and let people know that red meat is incredibly healthy should not be avoided that organs like liver and heart are super valuable for humans. They're essential for optimal human health. And that the reason they've been vilified is based on really, really bad science, including these in our diets, the diets of our children. It's critical for their health, for our health, for our optimal health long-term. And number two with the carnivore code, it kind of creates this spectrum of plant toxicity. Let people know that plants don't want to get eaten. They have toxins. Some people are more sensitive than others. 
But more than ever, I think that first point is so important to emphasize. And I see this in these emails from Heart and Soil all the time. We are all being told that every single disease under the sun, from heart disease, and we can talk about LDL and CAC, uh, coronary artery calcium scores, every disease under the sun is caused by red meat. And I think nothing could be further from the truth. And it's very important for people to know the truth, which is the reality of what we believe is really causing chronic disease. And this is, this is what's going to change where we're going. Because the striking fact is that humans are eating less red meat than they, today than they were 60 years ago. But our population is way sicker. So if red meat is really causing the problem, why is that? And there's so many other lines of evidence we can go down. But that's just so tragic to me that people are just being told this bad information and red meat is always the villain, when in fact it's the most nutritious food we could possibly eat, along with organs like liver and heart. Look, I'm, I, you're, you don't have, you're preaching to the choir. I think meat is essential. And certainly the concept of what does it replace, right? What will replace the absence of meat? And it certainly will be junk food, right? Okay. And if you're sitting there eating your plants and your, their whole plants and you have a very healthy life, you feel great and your hormones aren't tanking, that's great for you. But certainly I agree with you. I don't see a uh, real food. A uh, carnivore, animal-based diet as a significant issue to most chronic diseases that we face. Now, you know, one of the things you touched upon that I want to talk about a little bit is the, you know, the average physician's inability to do interpret LDL. And I want to talk about this because, you know, I've delved into the research and I'm even I'm at the point where I'm thinking about doing a lipidology uh, fellowship because I, I'm just so tired of it. We just published a study with severe hypertriglyceridemia. I don't know if you take a look at it. We'll soon be publishing a study on uh, LDL lowering without adjusting saturated fat at all, okay? Lowering LDL by hundreds of points without adjusting saturated fat intake at all. And the reason why we're able to do that is because we looked into the literature. What drives LDL? And so I want to talk about this a little bit because do you think that the hyperlipidemia, the high cholesterol of metabolic syndrome, do you think that's the same entity as your LDL being, I think, 500 I saw, my LDL being 250, you know, uh, you know countless other people who are lean and, or have been doing uh, low carb and are fat adapted and eating infrequently, is that the same hyperlipidemia? And does it matter? Is there a distinction or are they all, you know, should we, should we look at it like the medical convention that says these are all the same and high LDL means you're going to die of stroke and heart attack or is there a difference? And I want to hear your thought process on that. There's absolutely a difference. And I talk about this in the book. There's, there's nothing similar about them in any way, shape or form. This is my, my real big beef with Western medicine, no pun intended. It's completely myopic. They only look at LDL in a vacuum. And this is what I say in the book. LDL must be interpreted in the context of insulin sensitivity and metabolic health. And for physicians to just look at LDL is so, so limited in their view. If you look at even the epidemiology, like the Framingham study, like I do in the book, and you stratify the Framingham data by, you look at LDL versus coronary artery disease risk, and you stratify that by HDL, which may give you a third variable that gives you a sense of insulin sensitivity and metabolic health, you see completely different outcomes. You see that as the HDL goes up, and in the highest HDL quartile, HDL of greater than 45, which most of us metabolically people have, there is really no relation between LDL and cardiovascular disease. And this is, an, this is even an observational study. So there's clearly a difference. Clinically, I see it. In literature research, I see it. There's a huge difference between LDL that rises in the setting of ketogenic diets, low-carb diets, fasting, or diets high in saturated fat, like my diet, and I imagine your diet is, from metabolic dyslipidemia. And it's really, it's, it's so myopic for physicians to not see that because it's called metabolic dyslipidemia. It's not yeah. called metabolic hyper ldl I don't think they know. Dyslipidemia. I don't think, I gotta be honest, Paul, I don't think they know. I was on a thread with 15 brilliant cardiologists. I mean, these people are brilliant and they're presenting a case of a 40 year old. Okay, I know you're not far from 40. I'm 40. Tri athlete, right? A triathlete. I'm, I'm past yeah. 40. Uh, a 40 year old, yeah, uh, with a triathlete, uh, very lean, body fat under 15%, who presents with a, a high LDL of 200. Okay, and uh, that, that's that's fairly high for the modern standards. And he had a non zero CAC, which wasn't really evaluated, but it was non zero. And for 43, 
that's uh, at the higher percentile. That's like at the 75th or 80th percentile for men. Okay. And uh, the answer was emphatically, yes, 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 give them statins, okay? And I understand their viewpoint that to them, that's a familial hypercholesterolemia. I understand why they would say that. But I, I you know, posed the question, do you all know what's driving this? That was it. That was my question. Do you all know what is driving this? And the answers I got were, no, we don't know. Does it matter? Statin, statin, statin. And so, you know, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, and I presented data to them of one patient of mine. And in fact, we have a case series pending of several patients of LDL reduction of 390 without ever touching saturated fat intake. And nobody asked one question. The world's smartest cardiologists are presented with a 390 drop in LDL. And not one of them asked the question and not one of them cared to understand the etiology, what's driving that LDL. And so I got very discouraged. So I wanted to get your opinion about this. I know it's recent to me. Maybe you didn't catch it. It wasn't a big, I didn't make a big deal out of it, but I just thought to myself, like, what is the state of our medicine that um, nobody cares anymore? I don't know, man. I don't know. I think that yeah. it's, I don't know if it's just hyper litigation and people are just saying, Hey, Statin is what we've been told to do. Statin is the safe thing to do. And the, the pharmaceutical companies are just really, really good at downplaying the amount of side effects. I don't know what you see in clinic. When I worked for four years as a PA in cardiology, I saw so much myalgia, so much memory loss, so much libido problems with statins. I mean, the statin side effects are massive and they're way underplayed in the studies because of the way they structure those studies. So I think that there's just a real amnesia and purposeful ostrich syndrome sticking their head in the sand with regard to actual mechanisms around lipids. But let's just let's just be clear for everyone here so they know the backstory. We talked about this a little before the podcast. My father, at my age of 43, had a heart attack. He had an angioplasty. I have a family history of heart disease that's accelerated and early. So my pretest probability of having a positive CAC scan at 43 is, is, is pretty high. It's moderate. With with an LDL of 500, right? And that's the other thing. My LDL, my most recent LDL was 533 milligrams per deciliter. Not to give, not to be myopic, let's take about the rest of my lipids. To, you know, my HDL was 80, my triglycerides were 108, my particle count was greater than 3,500 nanomole per liter, and my HDL size is 24.7 nanometers, which is the biggest, the, excuse me, the LDL size, 24.7 nanometers, which is one of the biggest LDL particles I've ever seen. But when I saw that LDL of 533, I thought that's a big LDL. I should get a CAC just to prove to people my CAC score is zero. So my pretest probability was, you know, pretty moderate. And my CAC score is zero. I'm curious, did you get FH? So we have a question about FH test, you know, fam familial hyperlipidemia. I don't have it. You, you're, you did the seven gene and you're negative. I'm negative and I know I don't have FH also because I have lipid panels going back to when I was in medical school, you know, years Got ago. It. Okay, yeah. I had LDLs that were 100 or 90, so I don't have FH. So, so that's the thing. Now, if we presented a cardiologist with this data, they'd say 533, that's very high. Your dad had a MI at a young age. You need to take a statin. And they'll never ask the question, why is it going up? Why is it going so, up? Yes, yeah, so we have an interesting question right here from, from somebody somewhere. It looks like it's uh, Mike. He's saying, you know, any thoughts on FH and carnivore diet? Again, this is not medical advice, guys. Just realize that. But, you know, Paul, I think this is a good question for you. You know, what do you think about, uh, you know, FH and carnivore diet? Right. So there are multiple polymorphisms that can result in FH. There's over 2,000. And the four FH polymorphisms that I think are problematic are the ones that involve LDL metabolism. So you've got ApoB, you've got LDL receptor, you've got PCSK9, I think there's another one. Those are problematic. So there's a real, FH is a heterogeneous condition. There are some people with FH who get atherosclerosis and heart disease at the same rate as other people who don't have FH. And there are other people who seem to have accelerated atherosclerosis with FH. So I think it all has to do with how the LDL is being metabolized. I've talked to Dave Feldman a lot about this. I think one of the things we know very importantly is that atherosclerosis proceeds more rapidly in the setting of metabolic dysfunction. I have no problem recommending a carnivore diet to somebody. And of course, this is not medical advice. Hypothetically, if I had familial hypercholesterolemia, I would have no problems doing a carnivore diet. Well, you, you are, you have those levels and you are. I have those levels. I don't have genetic, I don't have right. genetic FH and this is what's right. so different and so important because 
if people try and use FH as a model system and they use a GWAS, they use a genome-wide genome association study or a Mendelian randomization, you can't use those with a, a genetic condition, a monogenic condition, because it can affect LDL metabolism. It's an imperfect model. I may have FH levels of LDL, but that doesn't mean I have the same LDL metabolism. So we can't use Mendelian randomizations or GWAS of people with FH to predict what's going to happen with me. So, but even if I did have FH, I would have no problems doing a carnivore diet because I know that I can check and ensure that I am very metabolically healthy. You guys want to know my fasting insulin? It's less than three micro IU per ml. My C peptide is 0.43. My hemoglobin A1C is less than five. My fasting glucose is 74. And I did a CGM for a month and my glycemic variability is, is in like the lowest you can possibly get. So I'm extremely insulin sensitive with my diet. I have no metabolic dysfunction. My HSCRP is undetectable. Even with an LDL of 533, there's no evidence it's including, it's leading to any atherosclerosis. Furthermore, we can say that I've had an LDL above 300 for probably two plus years. Most cardiac radiologists would say with a family history, you should definitely have atherosclerosis by now. And I don't. I've kind of, you know, gone back and forth with Spencer Nadolski a little bit about this, and we're going to do a podcast debate or discussion about it. But I think that the LDL model is totally flawed. I wouldn't have any problems doing or recommending a carnivore diet hypothetically to someone with FH. You just need to make sure that you're metabolically healthy. That's the context, in my opinion, me metabolic health. Get a CGM, get a fasting insulin, get a C-peptide, get HSCRP, know what your glucose is doing. And furthermore, we can get into this if you want before we get too deep. I know you don't want to, we're going to go short today. Know what your linoleic acid levels are. Know what your linoleic acid levels are. I'm really interested in this, and I think this is really a major driver of metabolic dysfunction. Yeah, I definitely see as linoleic acid goes up, metabolic dysfunction, diabetes all goes up. You know, there's a lot of association data. Uh, not that, I mean, at least it gets us asking some questions, uh, certainly asking us questions. We have some more kind of practical questions. We got Karen Oaks uh, over here who says, you know, somebody on the carnivore diet and they get constipation. Any advice, any suggestions? Yeah, so I talk about this in the book as well. I tried to answer every single question. It depends how you're doing a carnivore diet. <laughs> A lot of people, a lot of people when they do carnivore, they don't get enough fat. And if you don't get enough fat or enough salt, you're going to get constipated. Just eating tons of protein, tons of meat isn't going to cut it for most people. So you really got to do a couple of things when you do a carnivore diet. I think nose to tail is critically important. You got to get those organs in there. Fresh organs are better, but if you can't get the fresh organs, use desiccated organ supplements like we make at Heart and Soil. That's my company. I wanted to build this so that people could get these organ supplements from good places in New Zealand, regenerative farms in New Zealand. You got to get organs in your diet. You got to eat nose to tail. You got to get enough glycine. You got to do bone broth. And you got to make sure you're getting enough fat to balance the protein. Humans can only get so much protein. And repeatedly, I see people with constipation when they're eating too much protein, not enough fat, not enough salt. And that's the big problem that people run into with that. I talk about that in the book. Yeah, I very frequently use uh, magnesium supplementation in my practice. I think most people are magnesium deficient. Um, Why do you think that there's so much magnesium? So here's another, this is the interesting thing, right? Metabolic syndrome, for sure. Yeah, yeah so maybe that's, that's probably the factor, right? So if you fix the metabolic dysfunction, you won't waste as much magnesium. And we know this happens, right? In the setting of insulin resistance, we're going to waste magnesium and waste potassium because we're wasting sodium because insulin signaling the level of the kidney is, is really diminished. But if we can fix the metabolic dysfunction, I think a lot of people shouldn't need magnesium. But yeah, it's inter that's an interesting question. That's the same question with lipids. Like, why are people so many, so many people deficient in magnesium? Metabolic syndrome. Same thing, metabolic dysfunction. Where does that come from? A variety of things which we'll fix with these sort of ancestrally consistent ways of eating. We have another good question from a, from a doctor, this anonymous doctor. He's, he's always asking smart questions, though. So his question he's posed here is, let's say I'm a crappy carnivore, okay? The world's worst carnivore. All right. Wait, he didn't read the carnivore code, right? He didn't read the carnivore code. And, uh, and certainly like me, he's not a big fan of beef liver. Actually, the only liver, liver I'll eat is if it's raw and if it's fresh. So, and that's like an Armenian kind of tradition. So, but, uh, if you don't eat raw, fresh liver, right. With enough vitamin C, what's your, um, what's your take on vitamin C testing? Is it needed? Is it warranted? Do you, you know, would you look for it? I have seen very rarely on people, let's say, I'm going to give my clinical, you know, uh, if I had to back of the envelope number, maybe 3% of all keto carnivore patients that I've seen have a low vitamin C level of 0.1 or less. So, and that's, and that's rare. It's very rare. In one case in a patient who had um, gastric sleeve 
you know, came to me with chronic dieting and then had just started keto on her own. I saw low, very low vitamin C and, and some symptoms, but I haven't really seen uh, at least the phenotype of low vitamin C. I've seen the low lab value on occasion, but never really the manifestations of it. So any, any advice on that? Yeah. So in the book, I talk about the studies from the 1940s showing that 10 milligrams of vitamin C is, is enough to fix scurvy. I think that if you're worried about more clinical markers, you can check lipid peroxides, you can check 8-hydroxy-2-deoxyguanosine, you can check things like, um, you know, malondialdehyde or f 2 isoprostane. If all those are normal and they're getting a moderate amount of vitamin C, I don't think there's a problem and they don't have clinical signs and symptoms of scurvy. I don't supplement with vitamin C. I don't have a problem with people supplementing with vitamin C. I have a little bit of concern about megadosing with vitamin C, which would be anything, in my opinion, above 1,000 milligrams a day. But, you know, if you want to take some vitamin C, that's fine. I think you bring up a great point, and this, this anonymous masked physician brings up a great point. In any crappy diet, you could easily get a deficiency of all kinds of things. You know, a crappy vegan diet, you could get a deficiency of all kinds of things. A crappy omnivore diet, you can get a deficiency in riboflavin and folate. If you're not getting, if you can't eat liver, do the desiccated supplements like we're talking about. And if you're worried about vitamin C, check your level and check the other, I would say, the other downstream messengers of vitamin C. Because what do we want vitamin C to do? We want it to... to serve some sort of an antioxidant role in regenerating glutathione and vitamin E at the aqueous interface with the membrane and prevent, you know, scurvy from happening. So that those things are easily testable. And I have no problem with moderate supplementation if you're not, don't think you're getting enough. But I do think that theoretically and ancestrally, it's pretty easy to get a pretty good amount of vitamin C enough physiologically to be optimal with fresh meat and organs in your diet. That's uh, it's just some interesting questions coming in. A lot of more questions on the carnivore diet. Here's a practical one. You know, somebody's asking, uh, Dan Casper, it looks like, uh, good question. Any recommendations for marinades? So I know probably you're, you're more um, uh, probably against these, but certainly he's looking for marinades that exclude high fructose. Do you use spices? Do you use rubs? How like, I imagine you like using a crossbow and like putting it on a fire. So, you know, what, <laughs> what do you, what do you, you know, how do you eat your food? What are you eating usually? So what I like to do with my meat is I like affordable stew meat. You can get grass fed, grass finished stew meat from Belcampo or White Oak Pastures for 10 bucks or eight bucks a pound make bone broth a few times a week with end bones and has a lot of good collagen in it. And I'll blanch my meat. I don't even cook my meat in hot temperatures anymore. I've been doing this kind of extended experiment, I'm really fascinated by how few of the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and heterocyclic amines I can get. So you can just blanch your meat. I just boil the bone broth, throw the meat in there for a minute and you blanch it. It's cooked and it tastes good. And you're not exposing it to any heat on the pan. You basically make no polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or heterocyclic amines. That's how I do it. I'll eat a grilled steak every once in a while, but it's not become the norm for me anymore. So I'm kind of curious about this, how, how harmful they are for humans. I think we know that huge amounts are probably not great. We can probably process some. The thing I'd be careful about with marinades is the oil you're marinating a steak in. Like, I think if I'm happy you're eating a steak, please do not use vegetable oil. Please do not use corn, canola, soy, safflower, soybean, or any of these crappy oils. Rape if, if you want to use olive, you better make sure it's not cut with vegetable oil because the majority of olive oil is cut with vegetable oil. If you want to use avocado oil, the majority of that is cut with vegetable oil too. So I just feel like the easiest way to get a steak, either throw it on the grill, blanch it, and throw some salt on it, and there you go. If you can tolerate spices and rubs, do it. But I'm going to tell you this. People aren't excited about it. In the book, I talk about black pepper. Black pepper inhibits, inhibits UDP glucuronosyl transferase, which is a phase two detoxification enzyme. And phase two detoxification enzymes are also involved in detoxifying ox lambs, which are the oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism. So if we go using a whole bunch of spices and plant foods that inhibit phase two detoxification, we're going to inhibit glucuronidation of compounds your body wants to get rid of, and you're going to inhibit metabolism of ox lambs, oxidative products of linoleic acid metabolism. So tons of spices, just be careful of that. I, I try to keep it simple. I'm not a fan of the capsicum spices like chilies and stuff because there's pretty compelling cell culture data to suggest they change transepithelial gradients and may cause leaky gut. They, they look harmful to us. And clinically, we see that with people who have immunologic reactions to nightshade vegetables. So I would say, keep it simple. The steak is beautiful. The steak is delicious. You know, if you can tolerate rosemary or the leaf spices, those are probably less toxic than the seed spices. Please don't use vegetable oil when you marinate. You know, I think you bring up some interesting things here because uh, you hear this in the vegan circles. I, I pay very close attention to my 
whole food plant-based colleagues. I think some of them are very lifestyle focused. And so I'm always very interested when people are focusing on lifestyle. And so uh, one of the things they bring up is this high temperature cooking. And the fact that you're also on board with that and kind of thinking about that is interesting. There's some pretty compelling association data out of Israel showing yeah. that high temperature cooking is probably uh, you know, associated with decreased mortality. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with you. I think probably stewing meats, you know, uh, slow cooking meats, bone broth. I think that type of cooking is probably healthier. I don't think any animal was sitting there heating up a frying pan to 1500 degrees, taking butter, adding it onto it, mixing a bunch of spices, getting who knows what sort of pan, who knows what sort of fumes, you know, I, I so I very much, uh, I think there's a theoretical basis in the literature to say high temperature cooking is probably not ideal. So at the least don't eat well done. And then certainly I think that there is something to be said about probably stewing meats, getting all the nutrients out of the bones. Uh, and this makes theoretical sense to me. There's some data to back it up to. And I find that it's probably the environmental exposures even are probably going to be much less. Uh, you know, a lot of pans these days have all sorts of coatings, you know, oh, yeah. be careful with uh, that. Leo Trasande wrote a great book about that. So I also recommend that. Uh, so that's some great, great things here. We got a couple of other questions here. I just mentioned before we move on that yeah, sure. high temperature cooking of anything creates these products. So high temperature cooking of plants, roasting coffee creates heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. High temperature cooking of both plants and animal foods creates these compounds. So it's not just animal foods, it's plant foods too. When you like and you, when you brown toast, you're creating a lot of the same compounds. So it's a question of, of how well adapted humans are to detoxify these and how many we can actually detoxify in our life. So if animal foods are what it gets blamed on a lot, but actually they're in the plant foods too. It's one of the reasons I have concerns about roasted seeds and nuts. And even some of my concerns around coffee are related to this. It's burned seeds. So... Yeah, that's absolutely right. I didn't even consider that. Uh, certainly, you know, those things are all burnt and we're ingesting them um, in the crunchy fries and the crispy potato chips, right? Probably more of the same thing. Um, here's a question about supplementation, you know, um, you know, when on a carnivore, you know, when is it a supplement needed? Is a supplement needed? How long have you been strict carnivore? Uh, yeah. What's your, you know what? That's, that's a good question. What does your diet look like? You know, besides the stews and the meats, like what's yeah. the worst it gets? Okay. And I'm going to be honest, the worst it gets for me is nuts and dark chocolate. The worst it gets for me is like every now and then, you know, if I'm having a ice cream, you know, I'm a food addict. So for me, it's like, how do I stay away from the ice cream? Right. So for me, it's like protein shakes or something like that. Every now and then I'll rip something like that out. What does Paul Saladino look like when he's like, I can't freaking do this nose tail anymore? Or, you know, what happened? It, does that exist? You know? It doesn't, man. It doesn't. I think that I, res I understand that it does for some people. I'm just wired differently, man. Uh, I don't do it. It's not worth it to me. I don't like the way I feel. I really like staying steady. I think discipline is freedom. And I, I don't, it's not hard for me to refuse cookies, not hard for me to refuse you know, junk food. I don't eat junk food. I, I avoid it like the plague. So I eat pretty much the same thing every day. I love it. I eat, like I said, um, this is a great question about supplementation. If you go to the website, hardensoilsupplements.com on the about us page, you can find a video of how I eat in a day. So I filmed exactly what I eat in a day and it's, it's grass fed beef twice a day. It's organs twice a day. Um, I've been incorporating some honey in my diet. We can talk about that. It's bone broth every day. I eat bones. When you make the bone broth, the bones become soft. You can eat them. Calcium, silica, boron in the bones. So basically, I'm just kind of an animal-based diet guy. I've been strictly carnivore for two years. Um, some people say honey's not carnivore, and I say honey's definitely carnivore. That's an animal-based. That's an animal-based thing, man. Bees made that. Bees made that out of plant stuff. So you know, I think of it, honey as a carnivore carb if you want to use it. So, but I've been strictly animal-based for two over two years now. And when you think about it, you feel better with the honey. Do you feel better with the honey versus without the honey? I'm just curious before workout stuff like that. Do you periodize with the honey? I, I do the honey right now twice a day with meals. I don't do a ton. I think I'll do. How long have you been doing that? How, five sure. months. Five months. And when was the last LDL you checked? Uh, I checked the LDL uh, just two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. And same, same high level. 500. Yeah, I'm, I'm surprised with periodizing. How much honey are you taking? Because we've uh, seen. What's 100, that? hundred grams a day. 100 grams? Wow. 
Okay, so that how many that's how many carbohydrates? That's like 100 80, grams of carbs, right? Five, eighty-five or ninety, yeah. Yeah, so that's actually I'm surprised the LDL didn't come down. You must be working out a lot then. I'm guessing. I, mean, right? I work out almost every day. I'm pretty lean. Yeah. I was to Dave Feldman about this too. You know, that was a fasted blood draw in the morning. I I eat dinner early in the day, so I'll do I'll do kind of time restricted feeding. I eat breakfast and early a late lunch at two or three, and that's my last meal of the day. And then I eat breakfast at eight or nine in the morning the next day. When I got that blood work done, it was probably nine or ten in the morning. I've probably been fasted for fifteen or sixteen hours. I'm surprised with a hundred grams that you're still getting to you know. Yeah. getting to uh, that high of an LDL. Usually we found with carb periodization, you must be super, like how much would you say you work out a day? I'm just curious. Uh, I mean, not a crazy amount, man. I'll work out like 40, 45 minutes a day, but it's nothing crazy. I throw around kettlebells, I hit the punching bag, I jump around a little bit, I do the battle ropes. I mean, I'm not like crazy CrossFitter. I got right books. I like doing this stuff too. <laughs> I mean, I'm pretty fit, but yeah. Yeah, because we've seen with carb periodization of even 100 grams of carbohydrate, Okay, just like 50 to 100 grams of carbohydrate split up once or twice a day that the LDL really comes down. Um, so it, be, it was crazy. I got, I, I'm going to repeat another one. We'll see this week. I just tried another LDL today. Yeah, it took it took about six months on carb periodization to come down from like six, seven hundred down to, you know, under 200. Um, but certainly you're not going to feel as great, right? If the triglycerides aren't being shuttled around, right? So that's the thing. When the LDL drops down, usually people feel a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, I feel great. <laughs> I feel yeah. great right now, yeah. man. And, I mean, I feel better with the honey personally. So I was, I did zero carb carnivore for about a year and a half. And then I ran into a lot of muscle cramps and palpitations. And no matter how I tried with electrolytes, I just couldn't, I couldn't change it. And so people would say, what's the downside of honey? Well, honey is going to make you insulin resistant. Well, it absolutely didn't because I wore the CGM when I had the honey. That A1C, the fasting insulin, that C peptide. Yeah, your, your fat cells and your muscle are soaking that up. I mean, they're like literally, it's like you're, the sponges are empty, right? Oh, yeah. There's, there's no, there's no yeah. metabolic dysfunction from sugar if you're using it. Right. Yeah. I want to make sure I address the other question too about supplementation. I think if you're eating nose to tail, you don't need supplementation. And people will say, well, well, you have a supplement company. And the reason I created a supplement company with the nose to tail organ meats was that a lot of people won't eat the organs. You know, you'll only eat liver when it's fresh or raw. So I think that and the, the supplements that we make, the desiccated organ supplements are food. They're not supplements. They're real food. They're like low temperature dehydrated in the pills. So I think that if you can't get the organs, get fresh organs. If you can't do that, consider desiccated supplements. If you're getting nose to tail, you're getting glycine, collagen, bone broth, and you're eating organs and bones, you don't need supplements on a carnivore diet. I don't take any other, I don't take any supplements. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about one thing uh, while I got you here, because I noticed, you know, a lot of times we recommend uh, uh, as a hedge multivitamins when people are restricting. And if you've looked at any of these multivitamins, they are just packed with all sorts of crap. I mean, they're literally put sugar, cornstarch, beeswax, uh, soybean oil, and I've seen everything. And this is from the highest quality down to the lowest quality, or they put DHA in some of them now, right? And they you know, they claim they have fish oil or whatever, EPA, but they're trying to put this in and then it's, you can literally smell that it's rancid. So I'm just curious, you know, uh, what's your take on, I mean, I know this is a competitor to you, but I find a hard time finding quality supplements, even like the people who are doing protein powders and stuff like that. It's always cut with heavy metals and, you know, it's a really tough to get like a good quality product. It's so I, you, I agree completely. Yeah. I, when I see clients, I take them off all that stuff and you think about it like, Let's just do the let's just do the, the back of the envelope or do the math. Let's just really do the granular math. Like, what are we worried about people being deficient in if they're eating liver and meat and glycine? Like zinc, selenium, manganese, boron, copper. Like it's all there. Every single B vitamin is there. Like answering, taurine, carnitine, choline, K2. It's all there. There's nothing. I can read the back of a multivitamin and tell you every single food, every single organ and meat, and that's gonna have that in it. Like there's nothing in that multivitamin you can't get eating nose to tail, which is why I think that's so important. Like people will say boron, borons in bones, silica, silica is in bones, manganese, that's in bones and liver. Like there's nothing in, you know, manganese is also really high in tripe and stomach. And so I, 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 this is a fascinating question that I've asked over and over. And I ask in the book, like, what are we worried about people being deficient in? I see people on like zinc supplements and they're doing a carnivore diet. I think that's the least, the last thing you need. Your zinc is amazing. You definitely don't need B12. If you're eating liver, 
and, and heart, you're going to get tons of riboflavin and folate. You don't want to do dirty carnivore. You don't want to do just muscle meat because I see people with folate deficiencies all the time from that. Yeah, I'd say folate. Honestly, I can't tell you how many prenatals we've recommended because folate and vitamin C and D3 are like, you know, people are coming into me, you know, you're probably getting the super optimization people, but we have, you know, food, ad food addicts and metabolic syndrome galore, right? And, uh, and I know we're, we're tight for time, but vitamin D, folate, and vitamin C on people who've tried to do keto. That is what I'm seeing. You know, sure. you know that is what I'm seeing. So absolutely. So we got a shout out from a cardiothoracic surgeon who I've shown you some love uh, right here. So that, that's that's actually really nice. Dr. Philip Ovedia. Uh, maybe we'll get them all on one day and all of us can have a little chit chat. Um, so any parting words before everybody heads out? I know we had a 7.30 kind of cut off here. My three kids are dying to see me. Again, we're talking about the carnivore code, Paul Saladino's book. If you don't have it, go get it. Uh, he's got an audio book. Um, and, and, uh, so let's any, any parting words for us? I think that it's just it, 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 the dietary landscape looks so complicated in 2020, but it's really, I just like try to uncomplicate it and think, Everything that we're recommended, I think, is it evolutionarily consistent? Is this what our ancestors have been doing for 3 million years? And I think most of the things that you and I agree on and most of the things I advocate for in that book are things that I imagine our ancestors have been doing for 3 million years. And most of what's being recommended in the mainstream today, plant-based diets, avoidance of red meat, polyunsaturated vegetable oils or animal-based saturated fat, are completely evolutionarily inconsistent. It makes no sense. This is not what we've done for 3 million years doesn't have to be complicated. I think our ancestors were in tribes. They played music. They looked at the stars. They told stories. They hunted animals. They gathered plants occasionally when they couldn't get animals. They ate the animals nose to tail. And they just had good lives. And it was a simple freaking life. And it doesn't have to be complex for us if we're doing evolutionarily consistent eating. They didn't eat, you know, processed bagels and vegetable oils and, and sugar and Coca-Cola they did not make their carbohydrates 55% of their calories. That's impossible in nature. Impossible. So that's what I think is just like, don't, don't, don't let it be complex. Just imagine the way that your ancestors ate, not 100 years ago. I'm talking like 30,000 years ago or 60,000 years ago. And that's, I think that's what our genetics are doing is they're still, our genetics are still 30, 20, 50,000 years old. We're still in Northern Europe as homo sapiens hanging out with Neanderthals or back in Africa. You know, I, years ago, I want to give the kind of counterpoint to that and, and just to create a little like discussion here. So it's not also buddy, buddy, you know, the vegans, they always come to us and they're like, you know what, you guys all talk about this ancestral stuff, but you know what? Ancestrally, we were dying at 50 from cancer and heart attacks and you wow. never made, nobody made it to 90 years old and look at the Maasai. They, you know, they, they didn't get heart attacks, but they did autopsies and they found coronary plaques and, you know, look at the Inuits. Now they have, you know, diabetes and they're dying at 10 years before other Canadians. So can you just, I mean, like, look, I'm, I'm all great about ancestors, but I'm more about results. So I, I don't look, I gotta be honest with you. I'm the most skeptical person you find. I don't even trust myself. I take, you know, I just did a CAC, by the way. I just did a CAC, I got zero. I have an ultrasound. I put it on my own carotid and I check that CIMT, right? I check my own labs because ultimately results are what matter for me. You know, how much of this do you take on faith that, hey, look, the ancestors did this, let's do it, right? It makes more sense. This new process stuff is probably not good for us. You know, it makes sense to me what you're saying, but how much of it, are you like, do you believe your own Kool-Aid or do you verify your own Kool-Aid or do you like not even need the verification, you know, because well, for me, so I'm like, I'm like understanding myself, oh, you yeah, know, yeah. whenever I get the chance, you know, I'm like, I do wait, more is there, there? Let me just make sure, you know, like I just spent $2,000 of my own money getting blood work, man. I got stuck three times this morning, get a nutri valve. I got six more sets of labs this morning. I got a GI effects in the works. I did a microbiome test. I got a DNA age epigenetics. CPG Islands test coming. I got so much yeah. blood work coming in the next few weeks. I love testing the heck out of myself. I may, think it makes for great content. And I want to make sure that I'm doing the right things. And I have been testing, let's just say, the shit out of myself for the last yeah. two years. Yeah. I probably had 10 CRPs and eight testosterones. And any one of them, any one of them over 0.5? I'm curious. My CRPs? Yeah, any one of them over 0.5? I had one over one, I had one over 1 1.5. I had one of 1.7 on a Monday after I did the worst workout of my life and I literally had bruising on my muscles from tearing, but seven out of the eight have been less than 0.3.
And these are okay. CRPs. So yeah, so but very low inflammatory. Very low inflammation. Yeah, and I've done this with lipid peroxides and 8-hydroxy, you know, 2 deoxyguanosine But let me just answer those other devil's advocate points that you suggested. When people talk about our ancestors and they say they died early, that's really skewed by the infant mortality. We know that. You know, if you look at indigenous hunter gatherers, if they made it to fifty, they made it to eighty. You know, if they made it to fifteen, they made it to eighty. Generally yeah. speaking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's called squaring of the mortality curve. They don't have chronic disease, and for any plant-based advocate to say that indigenous people die of cancer or any chronic disease, that's that's false. You know, that's not happening. And to compare modern Inuits to Canadians is crazy because modern Inuits are you know being fed corn and you know, corn oil and, and alcohol. How do you reconcile the Maasai? Because I, I, you know, I have my theory and I, I want to discuss it. I know we got like three minutes left, but, you know, let's, uh, I know you got to head out too, you know, but, uh, but tell me, you know, how do you reconcile the Maasai, the autopsies and the Maasai? Because I had a, t I want to tell you how I got it, but I want to hear your thoughts first. So the Maasai are very interesting. And so what I, what I have heard about the Maasai that's compelling is that in the Maasai, the males are the warrior class. And they get out of the warrior class when they're 40 years old. And so the warrior class eats meat and milk and blood. And that's all they eat when they're in the warrior class. But once they get out of the warrior class, they eat everything. They eat grains and sugar. And I think those studies were done by George Mann in the 1940s and 1950s when the non-warrior class Maasai had access to processed food. So if you look at the Maasai, like the warrior class Maasai, I don't think any of those autopsies were on anyone in the warrior class. They were not on people actually eating milk and meat and blood. They were on semi-westernized Maasai. The other thing I'll say about atherosclerosis is that there's a lot of compelling data here. This is a really interesting problem or question. Did you know that all placental mammals develop atherosclerosis to some degree? So I think that there's a possibility that atherosclerosis is some degree of arterial repair. And they're just like we think it's like wrinkles, right? Like maybe. everybody oh, develops wrinkles, wrinkles right? They go away, you know, it might resolve yeah. because just like we're thinking LDL, high LDL in the setting of a low carb or a carnivore or high saturated fat diet might be different than metabolic dyslipidemia. I don't think all atherosclerosis progresses to plaque that ruptures and causes heart attacks necessarily. The fact that all placental mammals, and these are free living placental mammals, not just zoo kept placental mammals, develop atherosclerosis is fascinating. It's like, oh, is our body developing some degree to repair the turbulent at the branch points of the arteries? Is everybody's artery at some point going to get denuded at the level of the endothelium and you need some level of repair possibly? Now, is that on a continuum? And in some people with metabolic dysfunction, does that get out of control, form a real atheroma, which then ruptures and forms a plaque? So those are the two points I have about the Maasai. And I think that the most compelling is the first one, which is that uh, most of those autopsies were on people who are not in the warrior class and we need to be very careful, like, what were they actually eating? Um, there was some degree there, but, you know, I think that it's that it's not the same diet that they're touted for. Yeah. So we're going to end off here. Listen, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I, I can't wait to finish reading the book. It's been marvelous so far. Everybody, it's the carnivore code. And uh, listen, uh, we got one last uh, statement here. Saladino must attend Low Carb New York 2021. <laughs> we had to cancel 2020. Can we get a firm commitment from you for Low I Carb New York? There, what is it? Okay, well, no, it's not. It's not set yet. We had oh. to cancel Low Carb New York 2020 because of COVID. It was set to for July. Oh. So uh, we haven't set a date yet for 2021. But this uh, anonymous bright doctor is always kind of. You know, asking smart questions. He's putting this out there. So, do we have a firm commitment from Paul Saladino for twenty twenty one? Yeah, for sure. Perfect. All right, you guys heard it here. All right. Any other parting way? Any if people want to find you, how do they get you? The best place to find me is at heartandsoilsupplements.com. That's the desiccated organ supplements we make. All my podcasts are there. My blog is there. You can email me through there, and I'll I'll answer questions if I can get back to you. And then uh, the book is thecarnivorecodebook.com. And on socials, I'm at carnivoremd.com or at carnivoremd. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul Saladino. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Dr. Paul Saladino, this is awesome. We'll catch up again. When you're in New York, you got you to gotta hit me up. I can't wait. All right.